Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the uh, panel, let me welcome you all to a very interesting session we are going to have on uh, zero waste maximum value and what are the uh, innovative uh, technologies and uh, initiatives of various organizations they are doing. See, today, sustainability, circular economy, these are the become a buzzword today. You know, the morning you get up from there onwards, we think about all this. Even the uh, wastages. See, if you start in the morning, when you go to freshen up, the water, how much we are wasting there. From there, we started you know, our uh, waste. Then you go and pick up the milk packet. Then uh, you cut the milk and for tea, coffee or something and the packaging waste there, again packaging waste in study that uh, the packet, uh, the plastic thing, whatever, this pou pouch uh, we are using for milk from there onwards. Then uh, you boil the milk. Most of the people there are busy with the phones in the morning, checking LinkedIn and uh, or uh, WhatsApp, sending good morning and so many things and the, the milk get boiled and again there is a waste. In fact, no need to over boiling happens, you know, then the waste is there. Then, uh, Like that, you know, in morning to evening we can see a uh, lot of wastage, uh, you know, in our day to day, our own life I am talking about that. Then come to the uh, industrial side, like, you know, like food processing industry or I represent the packaging industry. And uh, we all know that in the packaging industry, for example, uh, like different, uh, generally the packaging substrates what we see today, uh, starting from uh, the PET bottle or uh, glass bottle or the uh, multimedia carton, aluminum can, like this. these are the four major things we see on a day-to-day basis. And how much wastage, you know, being collected and recycled. Okay, these are the challenges we are facing today. For example, plastic, uh, what generally in India, uh, the uh, the Ministry of Environment, uh, their data shows that around 70% of the plastic is being collected and recycled balance is going to the landfills. And uh, multi-layer packaging, of course, there's a challenge of collection and recycling today because there is no value for that. And uh, because these are the things, you know, today because of the convenience what we are looking at the on-the-go thing. You know, for example, earlier and all when we used to travel, we used to carry a, uh, for a jug for you know, getting water for the water. We take it from the railway station today. That is stopped now. We are all, you know, packaged water we are buying and going. So these are the changes, you know, because all convenience, like uh, uh, beverages now on the go. In fact, you know, what we, generally what is happening is that we consume water and throw or through the window of this bus or train, wherever it, we throw that. You know, there in the collection recycling is a major challenge. Like food waste also, in fact, a lot of food waste is also happening like that. Then agriculture waste, in fact, the post-harvest technology is still we are developing. There's huge uh, wastage is happening at the farm level. Because the farmers still, they are not advanced in our country because they're small landholders. Average land holding is uh, two hectares here. And uh, they don't have that much uh, technology, even in rural area, there are no roads uh, for them to transportation, on-time transportation happens to the, wherever for processing or storage for places, they don't have. Even storage area, there again, a lot of challenges are. Like each and every step, we are able to see the uh, wastages. So the today's discussion is about that, how do we minimize the waste, okay, and how do we control the waste, and also how do we process that on a better way? so that we would be able to meet our requirement. Even though uh, certain areas like uh, rice and wheat, we are uh, adequate production is happening, but a lot of other areas, you know, still we are uh, importing, you know, depending on other countries. So uh, how do we minimize and how do we become self-sufficient and how do we address those issues? That is the thing, you know, we are going to have a discussion uh, and uh, we will have a dis on this panel uh, for uh, till 11.30. That's what uh, we thought at 11.30 we will close. So I will request uh, my panelists. We are a very interesting uh, uh, panel today from different sectors uh, and all uh, major companies, like starting from one from General Mills and uh, Shiva from uh, Unilever and uh, <coughs> like that. No, I will uh, <coughs> then... Uh, Binisha is not there. 
And we have a Sanjay from uh, Nestle and Anand Rodia from uh, uh, Anand, what is your organization? Uh, Asuhana. So we have an interesting panel. So uh, I request uh, Anand, uh, what are the uh, challenges uh, you face in your industry as far as uh, the wastage is concerned and what are the initiatives uh, you have uh, taken to address those uh, things and what are the innovative measures you have taken? Uh, thank you, Ganeshan. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I come from General Mills. General Mills is a 160-year-old food company operating in about 100 countries. In India, we've been around for about 25 years. We have brands in India like Pillsbury Atta, uh, Hagen Das Ice Cream, Betty Crocker Cake Mixes, Nature Valley Energy Bars. Uh, we're a large foods company, and uh, we are dependent on Mother Nature for our raw materials. So, you know, food uh, wastage and food uh, loss is a big concern for us. I'm just going to take a minute first to explain what is food waste and food loss. Any food that is consumable but gets discarded is food waste. So edible food which is not consumed is food waste. It's food we waste in our houses, on our plates which we don't finish, at restaurants, uh, at banquets, etc. Food loss on the other hand is uh, food that is damaged or spoiled and non-consumable. That's the loss which happens from farm to fork during uh, harvesting, processing, uh, storage, tr uh, transportation, etc. Yeah? What's the scale of food waste and food loss? It's 30%. Uh, 30% it's of all foods that could have been consumed goes waste. It's almost a 1.25 billion tons of food that goes waste. Right? And what's the impact that, is, uh, that causes? I'd like to look at the impact in three parts. The first is the environmental impact. It's natural resources, water, land, fuel, which do not get used properly. The second is the impact on global warming. 6% of all uh, greenhouse gases comes from food that goes waste and goes into landfill. It causes methane. That's a big environmental impact. The second impact is economic, right? The economic impact is so huge, it's almost one trillion tons of food that's not getting consumed. It's a huge amount of uh, uh, waste. And the third is the social impact. Right? It further accentuates uh, inequality. There are still about 700 million people who go hungry every day in the world. Well, at the same time, one billion meals are wasted every year, every day. A billion meals wasted every day. So that, you know, difference between a shortage somewhere and a surplus somewhere causes a big amount of disharmony. So it's a huge amount of concern in terms of uh, managing food waste and food loss. And I'll come back to what we do about it. I'll hand over to uh, Shiva. Carry on. Practices you adopted in the food and beverage sector to achieve the circular economy in your organization. Yeah, thank you. Happy to be here and, and exchange some ideas on this subject. A few things that may be worth talking about. One thing is, of course, that the whole idea that a uh, what starts as a tub of ice cream can and should end as a tub of ice cream. So this whole PCR that happens in non-food categories but is still not permitted in food categories for all the right reasons because food safety is paramount. And here's where we believe there's a big opportunity because in many parts of the world, Unilever is able to do PCR packaging even for food products, as I'm sure companies like Nestle and General Mills are also able to. I think it's important for us to get the energy and the support and the collaboration and maybe even incentives to make this happen because uh, it's a big opportunity to, to have a circular economy. So that's, that's one. 
The other thing is that there are many components of farm produce which are not obviously used, like the skin of a tomato or a peel of an onion. Actually, there is value in everything. And we have uh, patented technologies which can get fiber out of, say, a tomato peel or any other goodies out of uh, the skin of any other fruit or vegetable. And we are happy to collaborate, share knowledge on some of these things with the wider food sector to make sure that everything that, uh, as Anand said, Mother Nature gives us, we make the best use of it. And what is perhaps the third and maybe a, an aspect of this which is already gathering momentum is this whole, most companies, I think, are able to today collect more plastic waste than they actually consume. We are also one of them. And we, through our partnerships with the United Nations and startups, are able to collect plastic waste, segregate plastic waste, get it reprocessed and put it back into the feedstock for some of our non-food packaging. So this is, I think, an area which is already gathering momentum. It's mostly funded by company CSR, which I think is a great thing because everybody uses plastic packaging. And if everyone can really pull in and get a lot more plastic segregated, collected, and recycled, I think it's going to serve the purpose of a circular economy. So these are some of the things that we are up to and uh, looking forward to a lively discussion on this. Thank you. strategies you adopted to minimize across your uh, value chain yeah. no thank you yeah. uh, do we do we need a mic or mm -hmm. audible. audible thank you <laughs> thanks a lot Ganesha, for, for inviting i think it's a, it's a topic which is extremely extremely important um adan spoke about the wastage of food uh, really one third of the food actually gets wasted globally in, in our part of the world, it's poor post-agriculture uh, and after the harvesting. In many parts of the world, it's more after the food is produced and sold. So a lot of time, the product goes through the expiry dates and back before dates and finally gets its way into a garbage. Uh, Anand, just to add to what you said, I was going through some figures. Uh, 120 kilos of food gets wasted uh, really uh, every year at consumer level. South Asia region does about 50 kilos of food waste, which is huge for uh, for our region. Uh, 50,000 crores worth of food gets wasted, a rough cut. The agricultural land in which this food is grown, actually, uh, in a way, the, the farmer is producing with a lot of effort but it never gets used. A lot of water, a lot of natural resources. Uh, and to your question, Ganesan, I think uh, food processing has a big role to play. I work for Nestle. Uh, as a food processor, I think at every, every level of the value chain, there are the opportunities where you can save. Let me give you a few examples and then we can elaborate on that. Uh, and let me talk about dairy a bit because Shiva started the ice cream thing. Milk, as we all know, is a very perishable uh, commodity. There are about 80,000 farmers from whom we buy milk every day, uh, twice a day, actually. Now, for this milk to reach factories, you need milk agencies. So we have put in about 1,200 milk agencies where the farmers come and pour this milk. And then milk in a temperature-controlled environment actually reaches the factory. So the Perishability of milk is not a challenge then at least for that ecosystem because the milk reaches the way it should reach as per proper standards and things. Once it reaches the factory, uh, again, I think we spoke about water a little bit and milk contains 82% more water. We extract water from that and use it for utilities. There's a project called Project Zirao. Uh, why waste water which is coming in the milk when water is such an essential natural resource for us and we all know the water level tables are coming down. Once we start manufacturing at all levels, uh, 
uh, and Shiva, uh, we're all doing this at, at our level. In the manufacturing, how can you reduce energy, how can you reduce water, how can you reduce GHG emission? So a lot of processes, and if Ganesan gives us time, we can elaborate on this a little bit more. But that's not where it ends. Two things or three things I would like to elaborate on. One is cow dung typically is being seen as a waste. You know, We are now putting in biodigesters at farm level where this cow dung actually gets converted into renewable energy. So a small biodigester which is meant for anywhere between four to six cows actually can generate renewable energy for, which is equivalent to about one and a half LPG cylinder. Uh, Anand spoke about social reasons, so a lot of the energy sources which were used earlier, the farmer is now converting into this. Not only that, the organic fertilizer which comes from this is, is great for the farmer because he can put it in the farm, doesn't need to go out and buy that. Stubble and many of us who live in northern part know a bit of contribution towards air pollution also become because because of stubble burning. Has anyone seen uh, uh, exhibition hall 14? Uh, please come and see. We have put in the biomass boiler concept there. Very simple concept. We are buying stubble from the farmer now, converting that into briquettes, uh, Shiva that briquettes are now being used as energy source and not fossil fuel. So that's another way. And lastly, I think we all as consumers have huge responsibility when it comes to waste. Uh, we all waste food. Uh, from a corp company uh, perspective, we ran a campaign called Kitchen Kari, where we encouraged, like what you did, Shiva, how to use the uh, so-called not usable parts of the vegetables and fruits and make delicious recipes out of that. So a few examples, Ganesan, and if, if there is more time, yeah. I'll elaborate on this. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Anjay. So, Anand, uh, what are the uh, innovative approaches your organization has taken towards achieving zero waste? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm just not touching on the points everyone briefed. Uh, at Suhana, uh, we basically run a spice company. Uh, we manufacture pickles, uh, spices, instant mixes with brand called Suhana. And a journey on uh, circularity or sustainability has started since 2014 now. And it was I originated with the idea that we want to become a waste-free manufacturing organization. So the simple methodology which we have been applying has been auditing the waste because a lot of you come from food industry here. So we started actually auditing that how much volume and what type of waste our organization is generating and actually create a roadmap for each type of waste which is either biodegradable, non-biodegradable, uh, metal waste, e-waste. Uh, etc. Hazardous waste, laboratory waste. Uh, and then onwards we have been finding solutions from uh, great organizations, scientists all around India and have been implementing uh, that sort of a uh, concept at our end. What we realized was that there are many great innovations already have happened in the country and sometimes we need uh, more than science of discovery, science of delivery is important. And then that's why once some of the good success stories started happening at uh, Suhana, giving an example of we produce uh, Kanda Lasun Masala, which is one of our major products, leader products, where we use fresh onion and garlics. So a lot of peels from onion and garlic is one of a waste, which earlier we used to dump it in a corporation waste or throw it or burn it, somehow manage it. But now we are making paper from the same waste. Uh, we are making, like sir said, from a lot of uh, spice waste like chili, dandal or other things, we are making uh, bio uh, briquettes for, as a fuel, source of fuel. Uh, we are doing uh, value addition on plastic waste also. Uh, of course, there is a much deeper perspective for how to handle uh, biodegradable waste, how to handle plastic waste, which is really sustainable, which is not. But at least 
and intent and will is very important in every organization that we take it up and that's what uh, we started the process with. So we have now almost able to manage all the biodegradable waste we, pr we have in our facilities, within our facilities. Some of the outcome is also we started largely organic farming initiative. So we use a lot of waste also as a compost. Uh, we use waste as energy. We use waste as creating value-added products. And we are also in Hall 14 in MOFPI, uh, uh, Sustainability uh, Corner, we have our foundation, which is also now helping other organizations to go waste-free. And happy to say that Suhana has almost achieved uh, waste-free premises as far as the biodegradables are considered. So more than 4,000 metric tons uh, uh, at a higher season, uh, annually what waste we produce, everything we are trying to recycle, upcycle, refurbish, reuse. Or we, I always say there is an approach of farm to fork, which has always been given uh, to uh, uh, industry. But fork back to farm is also one important approach that the waste should go back on the soil to the farm and enrich our soils. And there is a deeper science to it, the whole save soil movement, which has also been started, the top soil and the uh, organic carbon content of the soil. So all that has uh, been uh, also at uh, display there. And a lot of these approaches we use at Suhana and in a decentralized way because we have multiple factories. So how we can manage the waste at the factory resource itself or nearby. So that's what we basically do at Suhana. Thank you. So we appreciate uh, the efforts from your side also from your foundation side. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Ganeshan, and uh, thank you so much for including me on this um, really fantastic panel and for the opportunity to share some of these thoughts. Um, I, I, just a little bit to talk about PepsiCo. We are a food and beverage company. Sometimes it's forgotten that we are a food and beverage company, and we see ourselves as an agri company with strong linkages to agriculture. Um, I think one of the ways we look at circular, circularity is is sort of the respect for the idea that these are shared resources. So these are sh shared with communities, with people, and therefore a lot of our philosophy really comes from there. Um, the way we look at um, sort of circular economy is really about, we call it partnership to progress, which means that you do need to partner with communities, with government, with consumers, uh, to be able to deliver on circularity and sustainability goals, right? Um, so, if we, you know, to your question, Ganeshan, how does it, how is it meeting our sustainability goals? Like, if we, if we see ourselves as an agri economy, and like many of my co-panelists have spoken, it's across the value chain, right? Let me give a few examples to illustrate that. Uh, as two of the uh, taking a cue from the other two panelists, we are also in hall number fourteen, and if you were to visit our stall, uh, we are demonstrating the biodigester. Where what we are doing, what we want to showcase is that you know potatoes. We make chips. That's one of our Lay's and Uncle Chips. Those are one of our major brands, and the peels from the potatoes are being put into a biodigester, which then creates a biogas, which is then powering our plants. Right, so at, at that level itself, starting from the start of the production, we are making sure that waste is minimized or waste is used to create value, um, which is then used to power our plants. Um, in, uh, in other, sort of taking a one step further to sort of, you know, when we say, pro, um, you know, um, partnership of progress and how do we, how do you sort of partner with communities? Some of the work that we do is really around post-consumption waste management. Uh, we do a couple of things there. One is to drive behavior. Uh, so for example, in, in Agra and in Mathura, we work with a partner uh, where we're working with waste workers. So we've got, a, we've got people who are helping us in ensuring that from 4,000 different units, we are collecting the waste and segregating it. But also, we are empowering the waste workers. 
So whether it's to train them, give them PPE, ensuring, explain to them how waste works, which is another behavior change that needs to be driven, segregation of waste. A lot of the panelists also spoke about it, which sort of then leads to uh, recycling, to segregating that waste. And then also ensuring that even self-help groups, so this entire project it is circular in that sense, starting from you know looking at behavior at a unit level, working with waste workers to empower them, make sure that they are safe, then teaching them segregation, working towards you know, uh, recycling of that, and then ensuring that self-help groups of women are able to derive value from recycling, from creating products through recycling. So there's value being created there. It is very interesting that when those products are made, they actually created a brand around it, and the brand was named after one of the waste workers, and it's called Khushbu. Uh, it, it's you know it's a small but very significant and empowering uh, thing to do, and the various products around that can be sold, right? Um, if I, I I'm, I'm just wondering how much time do I have before I need to wrap up? Uh, you know, we in terms of other things that we do, we you know on the we have sort of partnered with the Swachh Bharat Mission, and we do something we we sort of catalyze something called the Plog Run, which is really about again partnering with. Consumers. So again, this is post-consumer waste handling, where people come in and, and, and you know, fitness with waste management. So they run and they pick up waste, which again sort of instigates that idea within. It it's sort of becomes broader. Um, and why do we, why is all this, you know, these seems small initiatives, but they are not, they're quite done at a large scale. But also, the belief is that this needs an ecosystem approach, right? There was some points being made earlier about the need for regulation. We, there are examples of you know, you know, being ahead of the curve in other parts of the world, which we need support and, and regulation and technology breakthroughs and innovation to happen within India for us to be able to bring those, right? Uh, most of the people, the companies on this panel would be meeting their extended producer responsibility 100%, collecting it, uh, and then how, how best can we recycle? For our beverage portfolio, we actually have recycled content. So we have recycled content in our bottles. So Pepsi Black and Sting, to those two brands, they, are, they have recycled content in the packaging itself, right? And so we've been able to move forward in some areas, which then therefore goes to meet our sustainability goals. But let me just wrap it up here, and then we can come back yeah, for questions. Thanks, yeah. thanks, Sashika. Thanks, Sashika. So <coughs> I'm going to ask one common uh, question uh, to the panelists. Uh, see, one of uh, our uh, major uh, stakeholders is our farming community, because we are all related to the food processing industry. The farmers play a major role, because without them, we cannot run our business. So I, my question to Anand, and later Shiva can also address the moment. Uh, so, uh, what are the uh, initiatives? You, what are the initiatives uh, your organization have done to minimize or the advisory roles, whatever we provide at the farmer level, to reduce the waste at that stage? Because of course you have a lot of innovative things at your factory level. But the farmers, you know, their literacy level is not so high and uh, they don't have that much knowledge and facilities to minimize their, their wastage at their level. So what are the things you are doing to handhold them in reducing the waste at that level? Uh, thanks, Ganeshan. I just want to add a few points before I come to that specific question. I think, you know, uh, two things uh, so that everybody understands the kind of scale we are talking about. First is when everybody says food waste, they think it's a developed world problem, right? India may come talk of food waste. So I have two questions. Uh, one is, you know, how much you think India contributes to global food waste? What do you think is that number? Guess? It's not so much. I mean, Indians don't waste so much food. We are thought not to waste what's on a plate. By food waste, I mean, khana jo tayar ho ke ban ke ready hai, not the food which goes spoiled. Produce food, edible food that we waste globally, right? India contributes 8% of that, which is, it's, it's an Indian problem too. We assume that we aren't people who waste finished, ready to eat food, consumable edible food, but it is an India problem also. While the global average is very high, of course, you know, the developed world wastes a lot more. 
Americans waste almost 40% of food on their plates at home and other places. In India, the figure is not small. It's about 50 kgs. That's one. And the second, while we've spoken about, you know, all the companies we represent, what do the companies do? The second thing I want to talk about is, of the food waste, how much do you think gets wasted at home? And how much is it at, you know, farmer level, production level, etc.? What's your guess on how much of food gets, produced fair food gets wasted? It's 60%. 60% of the waste we are talking about is food that we have wasted in our homes, in restaurants, in, you know, conventions like this, at marriages and weddings, where we load our plates and we don't eat it. Right? So it's 60%. So while we've spoken about what, you know, companies can do, I think one big thing that we need to do is actually consumer education. People don't realize the amount of food they're wasting. And simple things like, you know, uh, portion control, cook how much you can eat, right? Take how much you can eat. People don't RSVP for events. If a thousand people have been called for a wedding, the person prepares for thousand people, 700 lined up, 700 lined up convention. It's a lot of waste. So consumer education is really important and that's not being done. Yeah? I'll just come to some other things which, you know, uh, which we do as a company. General Mills uh, does a lot of work with farmers on regenerative agriculture to help them, you know, get better yields. So that's one part of what we do for farmers. But there are a couple of things that General Mills does to reduce food waste totally. And one is that first is half uh, the loss from operations. So we have a target to half the loss of food from operations. So using raw materials more effectively, making sure the processes are more efficient, uh, production planning is more efficient to reduce that. Second is, you know, I think uh, Anand mentioned it, is zero waste to landfill. That's a global ambition we have for, by 2030, to have zero waste to landfill. In India, we have a plant in Nasik, which is uh, India's largest producer of cake mixes. One out of every three cakes made in India comes from a Pillsbury cake mix. And we have the largest factory. And I'm very proud that Indian factory is already zero waste to landfill. It's one of the first factories within General Mills to be completely zero waste to landfill. And the third is to enable meals uh, through surplus donation. So surplus food available, a meal made available where it's required. General Mills does that through a program called Meal Connect. It's an app where, you know, it's, it's available only in the US now, where you can make available your surplus food as an individual, as a restaurant, as a hotel, and that's supplied. And we've done about 6 billion meals so far, and we have an ambition of taking that to about 30 billion by 2030. Thank you. Yeah, happy to talk about that. In fact, I must agree with what Anand said on, on the consumer side, and even Sanjay mentioned it earlier, because there are many parts of, say, fruits and vegetables, which even we as consumers don't use, but it can be turned into a delicious meal with, say, a Hellman's mayonnaise. So we market Hellman's mayonnaise, and one of the ways in which we do it is saying that it turns nothing into something. So what we think is nothing can become something when you add uh, Hellman's mayonnaise to it. But coming specifically to farm gate initiatives, I think the biggest thing that our farmers can do with is certainty. Obviously, farmers deal with a lot of uncertainty, whether it's weather, whether it's demand, whether it is yield, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think if we approach partnering with farmers or maybe even preventing food waste with this, say, idea of increasing certainty, then I think it really helps. So one way of doing it is, of course, regenerative agriculture, which we all feel strongly about, and it improves yield and therefore improves certainty of income. The other thing that we do in with FPOs, I mean, we all are familiar with farmer producer organizations or FPOs as they are called. And we are quite proud to partner with one such FPO called Sayadri Farms. It is in uh, Nasik and it's a collective of now a few thousand farmers. And obviously a collaboration or an FPO of that many farmers gives them a lot more certainty about the demand for their produce 
than say if they were an individual small holder farmer. So I think there are lots of examples of these FPOs or collective coming together of farmers which improves certainty in their life. So certainty of demand, certainty of yield. There's only that much we can do about certainty of weather, but we can definitely predict it. So for example, if our farmers know or are able to access through say an app or there's just so much technology available these days, which will give them the weather forecast or the soil health, etc. They can tweak their practices again to get more certainty into their life. So that's, I think, a way, the way in which we approach it. And uh, Sanjay, your thoughts? Uh, thanks, Kanesan. I think there is there's a lot which has been discussed already. And I think uh, I, I'll pick up a few. Uh, I'll again start with dairy. Uh, Whatever we do, we, we work on the model of creating shared value, which is that the work which is being done on the field, and I think Shiva picked it up for a farmer, certainty is very, very important because you can grow crop, but if it is not going to get used, then what's the benefit to the farmer? So we started our first factory in 1961 in Punjab in Moga, and ever since then we are working with farmers very closely really looking at sustainable practices, how to increase productivity and quality of milk. Uh, we have many colleagues who are veterinarians who are part of the team uh, who actually go to the farmers, give them the best practices which they can adopt. As a result, uh, what started as 551 kilos of milk on day one of our milk collection, today is 1 million liters. And a lot of effort has gone in. Uh, at every stage, there is hand-holding, but very importantly, and I'm, I'm copying what Shiva said, for a farmer, if there is milk, but if he is or she is not sure if the milk is going to get used, the incentive to really build the bigger farms is missing. So we have these 1,200 agencies, which I spoke about. Literally, farmer has to walk a few hundred meters to pour the milk. So that is one. Second is... You know, we, we keep talking about multiple issues, but farmer is very, very cautious on how to improve livelihood, like all of us. So once you give an idea, the pickup of that idea is really a multiplier and happens at lightning speed. So when we started putting in biodigest, for example, at the farm level, and the farmer realized that he's actually going to change the cow dung into energy, the pickup is very fast. So we have about 3,500 of those. Uh, the stubble burning, farmer doesn't want to do it. It was a need. But once you start buying that stubble, you know, the, the farmer will come ahead and start doing it. I think it's our responsibility as corporates to work very closely with farmers as partners to see what new technologies can come in. So this is really the dairy part, but that's not where it ends. Then there are coffee farms. So we work with about 5,000 coffee farms, really giving them our... Uh, knowledge, whatever we have, and club it with their knowledge to make sure that there is zero waste. So lesser use of water, lesser use of fertilizer, wherever they can. See, end of the day, we have to realize that they are the ones who are running this. Whether, Shiva rightly said, we can't control, they can't control, but there are multiple things which are still manageable. Again, wherever we work together with them, we find huge reception, and many a time, the greatest ideas actually come from them and our responsibility to then uh, scale it up and take it further. So th whether it's fresh milk, whether it's dairy, dairy derivative, so everywhere there are programs where we work with farmer community and create shared value with them. Great, great. Anand, from your uh, point of view, uh, what are the challenges you know, from your industry perspective? What are the challenges you face as far as the wastage is concerned? And, uh, Again, like, you know, you also work with a lot of uh, farmers because you source from them, right? You know, the ingredients and that. So what are those initiatives your organization has taken? Yeah, so... Um uh, the foundation uh, is known as uh, Eco Factory Foundation, uh, which has been uh, working on sustainable farming and rural entrepreneurship uh, center. 
uh, and uh, it has been we've been getting overwhelming response from farmers <laughs> we are basically uh, we created it as a mobile center because there are a lot of farmers who are coming and visiting and they said sir please make this mobile so more farmers will uh, take benefit of this center we call it shashwat bharat krushi rath it is traveling and we have trained more than 40000 farmers so far on various sustainable uh, farming practices like biodynamics permaculture regenerative agriculture rushi krushi panchagavya paddhati natural farming all initiatives which are happening globally on sustainable farming uh, we don't need to stop there because uh, like everyone mentioned here it's very important that we make sure the livelihood is increased not only the practices are better so what we are also showcasing that at farm level at very minimal capital how there can be nice value addition farmers can do through this mobile center which is going everywhere we do all these trainings free of cost uh, for farmers and we've been uh, also helping in lot of farmers in the groups who are getting trained can become our suppliers and some of them have become our suppliers who are growing spices or similar products which are our raw materials but then we realize that okay we have a limited set of uh, products which we buy uh, and soon i am going to connect the farmers to all of them now so i empower them more <laughs> but uh, then we realize that let's do something more for other vegetables and fruits which are required in the city we operate at least and we started this weekly markets for organic farmers and uh, farmers doing great uh, sustainable farming practices and i'm happy to share that in city of pune we are able to cater through weekly markets to lot of families and connect lot of farmers to sell it and the the bridge between supply and demand we are we are that bridge so that's how we are empowering uh, sanjay ji you spoke about cows ecosystem we also work very closely on uh, wastage which is generated in uh, uh, cow sheds and we have created lot of products other than the biogas also and the energy form also we are making diyas and dhoops from uh, cow waste and we are marketing uh, through a brand called adya herbals uh, and also now we are empowering other farmers to make it for us because we don't want to make it we have limited number of uh, uh, cows with us but now we are empowering other cow sheds to make it and we are helping procuring things uh, from them we are also available on uh, amazon and all the ecom platforms with that sort of a product line so we realize that like as i said the eco factory foundation offers solutions for rural urban industrial and individual part of sustainability in rural the set of challenges farmers face are different so we also tell them that how waste is a resource at wrong place i always tell to all ecosystems that it's a resource but it's lying at wrong place let's apply scientific and creative mindset innovative mindset to make sure we convert that waste into some sort of a wealth and this is how with all the farmers or industries we are working with we are showcasing this approach of waste to wealth and how the livelihood of the farmer will be developed we are looking forward to uh, interact engage with lot of farmers and we ourselves have 100 acres certified organic farm uh, and where we practice and try and showcase models and uh, treatments which are working very well in indian uh, ecosystem and we have lot of farmers coming and visiting our farms as well through that so there is an integration that how to grow how to add value how to sell and if anywhere we can become an uh, a bridge in between for buying and selling all kind of things we are trying to do thank you uh, thanks sir thank you fantastic initiatives uh, yes sir uh, we know that pepsico has been working with a lot of uh, potato farmers uh, so if you can brief us about your initiatives uh, what are you doing to improve their productivity reducing their wastage Yeah, thanks, Ganesh. I mean, it's a it's a challenge coming in last because a lot of what's already been said. <laughs> But yeah, let me let me try and see if I can uh, find another way of uh, of explaining so that it's useful for those listening. We work with about twenty seven thousand farmers uh, procuring. We are the probably the single largest um, chip grade potato pr procurement uh, agency, if I may say so. And uh, you know, I think. 
you know, just like a lot of what was already said, there are two bits to it, the what and the how. Right at the end of it, the farmer needs to make a livelihood. So the offtake, the predictability of the offtake is one of the big reasons why farmers would work with companies. And then we get to the how, and how could we better the how through technology um, to ensuring that we build predictability if we can't change patterns and at least we become, we make, ensure that there is more predictability and being able to assess what's going to happen. Um, the, way, the way irrigation is taking place, if we can handhold farmers through that. Um, and that's the kind of work that we are doing, just like a lot of what was already mentioned. But I do think it comes down to the livelihood and that having that predictability that the product will be, you know, will be sold. Um, and we work very closely on that front. Um, also, I do think that, you know, from a wastage perspective, uh, you know, I mean, this is probably a 10, 15 year old idea when, you know, food processing as a sector was still sunrise sector and we all explained how wastage is reduced when food is processed uh, because that's you know when when you have the ability to reduce the you know the ups and downs of food production which is the natural vagaries of agriculture and how that can be balanced out when food can be processed and i think this was this was an idea which was uh, which 15 years back we were all very comfortable with and I think it's it's it it's useful to get to get back to being comfortable with that idea that you know when processing is taking place we are creating livelihoods and we are reducing food wastage just by the ability to pick up uh, um, you know the production that takes place without it getting not being used and thus being wasted so yeah that's that's really it for now Ganesh and that's all I'd like to sort of say at this moment so thanks for Thank you. <coughs> so, thanks a lot. My name is Chilla, Chilla Kovács Rahoy, and I'm representing Lindström, which is a Finnish organization providing workwear, so uniform services for food industry customers. And uh, I was, I'm participating on this meeting in the last two and three uh, days, and it's very exciting to hear what's going on in India in food industry. Uh, what we are providing a circular service model for food industry customers. So we are not just designing workwear, but we are recycling and we are taking care of the waste. And I was very pleased to hear all the activities which are happening by General Mills, Nestle, PepsiCo, and generally you are focusing on your scope one, like your own energy consumption, your waste management, packaging, etc. Nevertheless, what I do experience it's not just in India, but across the globe as well, is that still it's food customers are mainly, or food, uh, food manufacturers still are still focusing on their own consumption. Here in India, it's really good to see that farmers are getting on board and you're educating them a lot. What I'm wondering is that, um, and what would be really nice in my view, that if these type of requirements, like being circular, focusing really on waste management would be part of the procurement processes by default. So this would be a kind of prerequisite as well. When, and, and I also heard um, Ms. Um, Singh talking about the regulation. When do you think that in India would, would reach that momentum, that it would be either part of a regulation or it would be really embedded in procurement? Because what I hear so far, it's kind of like a especially in bigger corporations, it's nice to have, but it's not, like finance is still overruling sustainability. So that would be my question. When do you think it will come? I can have a first go. Uh, I think, you know, we spoke a lot about what the companies are doing. I think there are three players, you know, it's the companies who are taking a lot of initiatives for the supply chain and the process they control. A big part is consumer education because a lot of wastage is there. And the third, of course, like you said, it's regulation and policy. Uh, the United Nations called out, you know, they want to half food waste 
by 2030. And a lot of uh, countries have signed up for it. It's something which will happen at some point of time in India too. Uh, the government, I think, is very invested in, uh, in doing what's right. But it's very difficult to give a time frame to that. Right? Because when you say it's still controlled by finance and procurement, there is a cost to sustainability. And eventually, eventually the consumer has to bear that cost. Right? It's not the government who can fund it. It's not companies who can fund it. So I think it will happen as the process builds and as uh, you know, uh, things fall in place, that it becomes a natural way of life. And, and consumers are comfortable saying this is the right thing to do and willing to pay for it. Yeah, I could add, I, th I think that's a... Yeah, that's a great question. And as I was reflecting upon it, I don't think that it is going to be an overnight kind of a shift. It's going to be a journey. And one business of ours that I can talk about, which is tea, we've come quite a distance in that. Because today, more than two-thirds of all Indian tea is certified and we were part of devising a local sustainability code for it it's called trusty and in the last 15 odd years or so i think we've managed to raise the floor on on the tea crop in india and we're also quite committed to non-deforested sourcing of many crops including and especially tea so I feel that it will be a journey which will all add up rather than waking up one morning to a, to a... And I think it's important that we all be part of that journey and we do our bit like we have done, for example, in tea. Yeah. Uh, I'm just, just adding to, to what has already been said. Scope 3 is also part of the emission calculation for companies. And if we don't work at the farm level and reduce waste, those numbers are not going to come down. So all the effort which has been taken at farm level is, and waste is one of the critical elements there. Uh, deforestation, palm oil, sustainable coffee, sustainable cocoa. So all this is actually being worked out by the companies and really looked at uh, I think we spoke about financial and procurement, but also from an emission perspective. And, and that's the way it is going to go. Um, and I have a feeling the way all of us are making commitment, uh, we want to be net zero by 2050, for example, globally Nestle. All this will be steps towards that direction. And that is happening today. Future, uh, I think, is going to be better. Uh, uh, one of the part of the question was how also this will be embedded in government policy making, if I'm not wrong. So uh, I think uh, we have seen a lot of uh, changes in the policy at government level. And EPR is one great example uh, where uh, plastic recycling, I would say revolution has started in India now. and. People are now looking at uh, all government organizations I'm working with. I'm seeing amazing efforts, budgets, which they have sanctioned to do better and bigger research on how better recycling, better value addition can happen in the waste material which is produced. So I'm also seeing uh, a sustainable fabric is a new, uh, complete new uh, fashion vertical which is getting emerged and most of these fabrics are created from waste from food industry itself so there is a lot happening when at a country level also we are saying by 2070 the country to go net zero but a lot of uh, downstreaming and policy making actually is happening uh, and back and forth communication with uh, uh, authorities that how individual case studies that your organizations will achieve the la goal of net zero and how that can be converted for policies for government to create for industries at large but when we speak about India and when we compare it to uh, the other developed ecosystems we need to always keep one thing in mind that there 
uh, we represent just a small part of a massive ecosystem called India. And there are many SMEs and MSMEs which face very complicated and different challenges. So to make sure that these kind of policies to get integrated for them and they're sustainable for them is not that easy. But I'm sure if we have will and intent, we will definitely achieve at large. So. Yeah, not much left to add to that. I mean, most, most, yeah, just like everybody else, most of us do follow sustainable sourcing norms when it comes to procurement. Um, on the policy side, very well said by Anand, right? It is going to be a journey. There are many of us who are already doing it. And look, people sometimes are surprised that India has a 100% EPR requirement. When I speak to colleagues, you know, in within PepsiCo and other parts of the world, they're quite surprised that India has that. So there are moments when Indian policy is sort of running ahead. And then there are moments when, you know, we, we could see... Um, we, we, we'd like to see more, right? But in in sort of setting up that policy, one is is the broader ecosystem ready to take that on, right? And the to have the capacity and the capability. So the capacity and capability will need to build be built alongside the regulatory requirement. But I do think that regulatory requirement gives many of us who are already doing this predictability and sort of a level playing field, right? Uh, and that's when, when that level playing field happens with regu regulations, that's when the consumer behavior will change. Because, yes, we are doing it, but is the broader ecosystem doing it? But we do also understand it's a journey. So I think, I don't know, I've kind of made completely grade the water here, but <laughs> that's what I mean. Like, yes, regulation should happen. Yes, it should be in line with capacity and capability. Those of us who are already doing it should be in the room when those regulations are being planned. And I do think when that regulatory predictability happens, consumer behavior will start to shift and some of this will become easier. Um, in corporates, it's generally said that what gets measured uh, gets managed. So are there any initiatives uh, on using technology as an enabler? to be able to manage the waste across the value chain, not just within the operations. So uh, Anand sir mentioned about waste audits as one measure, but do you think traceability or um, other initiatives um, within technology, like it could be either a life cycle assessment for at the product level, do you think such enablers could also help um, I kind, of, kind of assess the impact and be able to kind of take initiatives? around uh, waste management? And uh, what could be other enablers in addition to technology for a more circular economy approach? I'll just take one sentence. Uh, you know, when we say that there are targets, uh, they have to be really measured before you go and start declaring it. So while we speak, uh, there are robust measures to ensure that the and no, it's not only at the manufacturing level, it's also at the farm level to make sure that, you know, if you're saying that so many tons emission reduction has taken place, there is a data to support that. And uh, without technology, it can't happen. So to the question, uh, since I represent the, the packaging industry, I can talk about uh, the uh, life cycle. LCA, you had mentioned about that. So uh, globally, a uh, lot of organization, they have been doing this uh, LCA study, life cycle assessment study, from production to end of cycle, uh, what is the carbon footprint of each and every stage. So generally, what is happening in uh, India is that a uh, lot of people talk about recycling. Okay, That is one thing people consider that. But when you talk about sustainability, not only recycling, a lot of other things are there. Because see, when you produce for the packaging thing, we make aluminum cans, for example, or glass bottle or PET. So what is the, the production stage? What are the things, you know, that energy we are using or water we are using? That one audit is done. Second thing, uh, when we talk about life cycle assessment, the transportation cost, you know, from the production to the filling station, what is the transportation cost? Okay, for example, if I transport the uh, empty glass bottle, how much fuel I'm, I am using for that? Or if I uh, transport PET, how much fuel I am using? And how much fuel I am able to save there? Okay, and uh, so that is also their own part. So third, thirdly, that uh, 
when the consumer buys that and put it in the fridge for uh, chilled uh, thing, something you want to drink, and how much energy we are using there. Okay, now how much energy each uh, substrate is taking. So these are then finally, after the post-consumer wastage, how the recycling, whether we are able to really close loop recycling, we are able to do and bring that back. So these are the measures, in fact, as far as packaging, at level packaging industry, they are doing that. And coming to other, in fact, uh, because I also had worked with some of the uh, agri-based industries, there are also a lot of things are happening at that level, and plus, they are also educating the farmers at that level how to reduce uh, less water, to how to increase the productivity, how to use less pesticides or less fertilizers to reduce their cost and plus improve the productivity. And overall, the overall objective is that how do we achieve the sustainability goal? Because uh, there are a lot of challenges even in um, traceability for certain value chains. Um, many agri commodities such as wheat, for example, it's managed by FCI in India, so it's very difficult to have traceability. And especially for managing the post-harvest uh, losses, I think that is a key aspect. Uh, so do you think there could be other enablers as well in terms of policy, in terms of uh, other uh, maybe um, aspects that could be used for circular economy, uh, especially in food waste, uh, managing the food waste? I, uh, I want uh, not enablers as such, but there, there, there is a lot of uh, uh, thought process which also needs to happen at a change of our mindset that how we want to do this. I think the main constant should be the mindset of the management and people on board, uh, that constant will make sure that everything really changes. Okay, this is still too non-technical, but I will prefer you to visit the, uh, the exhibit, small exhibit we have, and there we have actually showcased way forward to net zero waste. And small 10 steps approach we have maintained there. I think these are, uh, in nutshell, whatever we felt is very important to achieve net zero waste those 10 steps have been mentioned. Plus, we are now trying to use a software to manage entire ESG part of the organization. So once things are getting mapped constantly, the data is getting mapped constantly, the better, see, the, the audit part I said is to get the right numbers in hand quantitative and qualitative. Once that is in front of us, the decision making is very easy that, okay, what is the most difficult part and the serious issue? And then let's address that first and how we can solve the other parts later. So that's why uh, scientific auditing for uh, waste will help a lot. Traceability of raw material and waste are two, two totally different aspects from my perspective because that's a much bigger uh, uh, issue we face when we are sourcing from an unorganized sector. But like uh, uh, Sir mentioned that they are doing a lot of sourcing from FPCs and FPOs. That's where a lot of issues of traceability can be resolved when you are pro procuring your raw material from an organized supply chain. So for example, at a spice level, we work with spices board because they have identified many FPCs and FPOs who are doing control uh, spices uh, growing at a farm level where uh, integrated pest management approach has been uh, implemented. So these are the perspectives which industry needs to apply and work. Again, at a policy level, uh, government has promoted formation of F FPCs and FPOs at large, which was not ever the case before. But now many FPCs and FPOs uh, who are producing uh, controlled, uh, quality controlled raw material, where the treatments given to those plants are, have been documented. So at least traceability is better than prior. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you, so you thank you for your amazing insights. I think it's been a great discussion. Uh, my name is Dhiren. I represent uh, one of the largest uh, flavor fragrance companies in India called Keva. And uh, uh, on a personal level, I'm interested in zero waste maximum value to a larger extent. Uh, I have an angel fund that invests specifically for startups in this phase. One of the companies is uh, segregating waste at ultra high speeds using robotics and uh, machine learning. 
Um, another one is using upcycled uh, spent grain. And we are also working on upcycled pomegranate skeins, uh, upcycled uh, grape pomes, which is all very, very high antioxidant properties, ultra, ultra high UV blocking properties, and so on and so forth. I have two questions. Um, one is related with how corporations like yours support startups to scale up and include these into your ecosystem to help uh, them grow and also help your business grow with these ideas. And the second is, Anand, you mentioned about the consumer. How will the consumer be educated into adopting, let's say, by launching an upcycle product, a certified upcycle product in your range? I don't see that yet in the market, but there is an opportunity, I would hope, at some time to see that. Uh, I'll take the second question first. So I think, you know, uh, consumers are willing to pay for something they see value in, right? You take products now which say better for you and people are willing to pay for it. Lower cholesterol, lower sugar, uh, more organic, etc. If sustainability or better for planet is of value for them, they will pay for a sustainably sourced product. Right? At some point of time, probably it will happen at a slower pace in India, but there will be an opportunity. And companies will start doing it when they also see there is traction for that opportunity. So that's going to happen. Uh, I think every corporate now has, uh, pretty much every corporate I think has a startup fund in which they put in products which are more relevant to uh, the categories they are in. General Mills does that for uh, products which are related to the categories we are in. Uh, India is still a small uh, sort of setup, so we don't do anything yet in India, but globally we do a lot of work in you know, startups which bring in a lot of, a lot of uh, new learnings into food science, new learnings into packaging, shelf life increase, uh, healthier products, uh, a lot of these things. I don't have the specifics to tell you now, but we do do it. Yeah, I can just chime in here with uh, our intention and a couple of examples of working with startups. So firstly, we are super agree with and super support working with startups in this space. I think they are very much part of the ecosystem, very much part of the solution. In fact, our waste collection and recycling program works with the startup Zentio, I think, along with uh, as part of the United Nations program. We are recently collaborating with a startup called Arogyam to work with them to develop a rapid testing kit for smallholder farmers to detect pesticide residues in green leaf and made tea. So completely agree that startups are an integral part of the solution. And I don't think we should be telling ourselves that large corporations can do it on their own. We should very much be collaborating with, with startups. Very similar. Uh, so we have a Nestle R&D, which is global, uh, also a center in India in Manesa, uh, where ex these startups are encouraged to come and work on projects. Um, really agile. Uh, teams we see there uh, coming out with new ideas. But just to answer your question, yes, uh, that is part of the part of the work which we do. And if you have any startups who you think are very good in this area, especially to do with waste or packaging or whatever, uh, please request them to reach out to the R&D center. I can give you the numbers. Thank you. Uh, startup, of course, we work. but. Uh, interestingly, you've asked about upcycle products and if I have, we have launched them. So as I just earlier mentioned, some of these products now we have launched actually officially and we are using your fragrances to make some of the dhoops also, let me tell you that. Uh, but uh, yes, it's an exciting space uh, to create these uh, solutions where we have upcycled our waste to create some value added stuff and find the right market gap because it's it's really important that we are addressing or, or solving some of the customers' problems and the products we create are not just out of our own creativity but are actually market uh, gaps. For example, when we have created paper from garlic and onion peel, uh, 
paper market is already gone down the usage of paper is reducing day by day so now we are working on few more products to create out of that which probably have a lot more demand and that could be scalable operation for us so we do apply mine like that and lot of upcycle products right now from our agri waste or factory waste have been launched they are used they are sold some are in quite loose format and some are quite in a branded and and an or, uh, organized uh, format which we are doing and more than 20 green entrepreneurs or uh, startups we help support promote their products use their technologies uh, to create these kind of things at our end so we work a lot um, I just like to add just like the others yes we do work with startups very intentionally work with startups because I think a lot of the innovation that can that we are looking for is probably is likely to be uh, you know driven in the startup community. We run accelerator programs uh, with uh, you know certain institutes. We also have a fund which is dedicated to finding startups and then you know uh, funding them. Um, and and also you know the, I was talking about this work that we are doing in in UP where we are working on with somebody with a partner called Purna. Uh, on waste management, and that was something that we funded out of our PepsiCo Foundation, and is now, it's it's good to go on its own. It's made a success of it, and it's good to go on its own. So yeah, there are various models that we do partake of. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is Vikas from Jetben Supply Chain. Uh, this discussion, what we, what personally I observe, is more about the farm gate interventions and the wastage. I would be focusing more on the supply chain component, the losses part, from the farm gate, retail minus one. If we see in India, wastage is post, uh, I mean, say retail or the, the wastage component, the agriculture losses is from the farm gate, retail minus one. This component, the supply chain, is not quantified because it's very difficult. I think 11 billion US dollars was Indian uh, investment requirement for gold supply chain and stuff. A very basic, the pioneers in the industry, the processing, you have the SOPs, you have the standards. And if we see the dots, like I'll say that, for example, irradiations, self-life enhancement, anti-sprouting, sprouting inhibitors, spice, sterilization without using methane oxide. So they are technologies which are lying in different parts of India. Like we are the startup are running the biggest irradiation facility for agriculture in India. But when we go to the market, the point we can say there is a waste, there is a loss reduction. We can reduce, suppose for potatoes, losses from 30, 25% to less than 5%. Sprouting inhibitors, starch we can control, we can sugar we can do with irradiations, gamma irradiations. But the moment we can only check with NAFAID, government organizations who are working in volume, who see that the losses reduction is the goal, when corporates like you, who have got the SOPs, who know the standards, who are doing it individually, can handhold rather than financing the startups, can you know exchange the SOPs so the people you know copy the start the corporates better as compared to a startup or a government agency. Yes, suppose this company is doing it, they are great into it, and suppose X Y Z processing though this that is fantastic. When these boom starts, the agriculture losses which India is facing drastically badly can help be a butterfly effect. That was I request corporates like you to come in the SOP discussion mode with the startup rather than just the funding aspects. Uh, that is a view on that, that about the technology transfer, SOPs, because the dots are there. I think there are 15 irradiation plants working in India, for example. This year, the agenda was 50 plus irradiation plant to be built in India. So we need a corporate stuff who can support those startups who are investing heavily into it to gain the momentum. A th word or thought on that, please. I can only say it, it's a very good idea. I think what you have put on the table is, is really worth considering. I don't think you are looking for an answer here, but uh, a really, a really good idea. If you want, you can send us a mail, all of us, and we'll see uh, how we can take it forward. I'd like to extend that offer. Anyone with an idea who's looking for support, whether it is 
in SOP or in whichever other form is very welcome to reach out to us. That would be great, mm -hmm. sir. We'll get in touch. Uh, sir, I just want to share. The, uh, the idea and the formation of the foundation was to express those SOPs. And that's why the foundation is working. So if you just visit the stall, all the SOPs, all the practices we are doing, we want to share. That's the whole idea. To share as much as we can to community and to make, because it's a larger interest to protect our environment and planet. And that's what we are trying to do there. So, and we do everything, the, all of this uh, 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 without any uh, cost or fees to the startups or farmers or all the ecosystems. So please visit. My name is Alok and I work for Banas Dairy. And uh, my question to the panelists is like, what sustainability practices we are adopting for uh, uh, reducing water footprint? You know, uh, we are uh, doing the wa uh, water harvesting, rainwater harvesting systems, but what we are doing actually to reduce the footprint in terms of uh, recycling and re reusing the uh, treated water. So what practices is, are being, uh, you know, adopted in the uh, industries? This is my question. So there are multiple practices. You know, I'll pick up three or four. One is definitely at manufacturing level, um, the companies have targets to reduce water year by year. So I'll give you an example that we recently started a big campaign called Jalhi Jeevan, where everyone in the locations, uh, in this case a particular location, is encouraged to give their ideas on how to reduce water. So one is technology, the other is mindset. So really that is one. Second, I briefly talked about extraction of water from the cow's milk. You know, end of the day, that milk was getting wasted. That milk is now being used for, for multiple purposes. Then at the farm level, uh, whether it is the coffee, whether it is dairy, working with farmers to see how you can reduce water, give them ideas on how they can reduce it. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, we have trained over 100,000 farmers, 70,000 of them uh, women, on practices like this. So while technology is playing a big role in reducing water, also we see when the awareness gets created at all levels, that is also helping. We are also putting in water fountains in village schools, basically for two, two reasons, two ideas. One is providing clean drinking water to the school children which is really needed. And the second is how to create water ambassadors because wherever you put these and you talk to students about water conservation and preservation, you are actually taking that message across to villages and, and, and cities and so on and so forth. So multiple areas and I'll be very happy to take you in more detail on exactly what is happening. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe I'll wrap it up <laughs> because this is the last question. <laughs> No, I think uh, Sanjay has had some great examples and we have certain similar ones, right? Uh, a couple of examples. We definitely take a watershed approach to the areas that we are working in, right? And again, going back to the partnership of progress idea, we work closely with communities to really understand what their requirements are. We look at the groundwater levels, watershed, what's the watershed uh, area, and then we would create water bodies which either collect uh, rainwater and then which you know, feeds back into the groundwater. That's, and we do it across all our plants. Uh, all our plants are 100% replenished. So whatever we are using, we are replenishing already. Um, then there are other innovative things that we are doing. You know, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm sure there are, uh, pra they're practiced in other, other industries as well. We have something called Project Murphy. So when we fry potatoes, because potatoes are high in water content, the steam is let off. And then we capture that steam and use that water back into the systems to wash potatoes, etc. So that's the circularity that we've maintained, which is another sort of thing that we do. And again, such you know, under wash, under you know, sanitation practices, we are working with communities to ensure that water is being provided. And yes, there are some of the ideas that we are taking care of.
including the consumers as well. So as you rightly said, we are, have to work together, not only the organizations, even consumers. Also, we have to create awareness, how do we minimize the waste, and how do we support achieving the circular economy and zero waste. So thank you so much. In fact, uh, we were all concerned when we got the invitation that this panel is on a Saturday morning, and we thought whether audience would be there. But uh, without your supporting work, yeah. it would not be possible. And it was really lively, a lot of good questions. Uh, all yeah. provoking questions yeah. were there from the audience. So thank you so much uh, for all of you, uh, my panelists, for panelists as well. Thank you, thank you once again. Thank you.